in this series of videos, we're going to talk about inventory. And when I think about inventory, I often think about Walmart or any big retail store. And if you walk around any store, the stuff that's sitting on their shelf, that's their inventory. Inventory is anything a company buys for the purpose of reselling for more money. That's essentially what we're talking about when we talk about inventory. So um, the best way to explain inventory and the challenges of accounting for inventory is to actually do an example. And I'm just going to give a quick kind of uh, simple example of dealing with inventory and how it gets a little bit complicated. So let's talk about Walmart. Walmart's the largest retailer in the world. They buy and sell all sorts of different types of inventory. And I want to talk about an exciting type of inventory you can get at Walmart. I want to talk about socks. So Walmart sells socks, among lots of other things. And uh, I was just in Walmart the other day, and I could get a pair of socks for about $5. But of course, when Walmart, if Walmart's willing to sell me the socks for $5, they're not paying $5 from their supplier. And I don't know exactly what Walmart pays from Hanes or whatever brand of socks they buy, Fruit of the Loom. Uh, let's just say they buy their socks from their supplier for $2. They turn around, they put it on their shelves, they sell it to me for five. That's what Walmart does, right? They mark up uh, the, the cost from wholesale cost, what they pay to retail cost, what we pay, and that's how Walmart makes money. So uh, uh, let's look at, look at this from the perspective of Walmart. Okay, we're Walmart. It's January 1st. We buy a pair of socks from Hanes. So January... First, we buy socks from Hanes, we go debit, inventory, and I'll just put in brackets here, it's socks, and Walmart would go further than to call it socks, they would say it's Hanes, white, men's size, you know, 10 to 13, or whatever size range they, the socks fit, and they buy the socks for $2, and of course, again, Walmart would never buy one pair of socks at a time, they would buy hundreds, maybe even thousands of pairs of socks at once. But we're pretending here, just for this example, they buy one pair of socks for two bucks, and Walmart never pays anybody cash, so we credit accounts payable. They buy it on account, of course. Um, okay, and January 2nd, <clears throat> I walk into Walmart and I say, oh, there's a pair of socks, I'd like to buy them, and I see the price is $5. Of course, I never see this $2, that's invisible to me. I see the $5 price tag, I think, yep, I need socks, $5 seems like a fair deal. I was just in a sports store the other day, they had socks selling for like $20 and $30, I couldn't even believe it, I could not believe it, I wanted to buy socks, and I was like, no way, I'm going to Walmart or Costco or somewhere cheaper, it blew my mind. Anyway, I see the $5 price tag at Walmart, I'm a buyer. Okay, so I buy the socks. So again, we're not the buyer here, we're Walmart, we're selling socks. Uh, when, when the customer buys socks, Walmart puts cash in the till, right? The customer pays for the socks and has sales revenue of $5. But actually, whenever Walmart makes a sale, there are two transactions happening at the exact same time. One, there's money coming in, and two, the customer walks out the door with our socks, right? Those socks, those inventory, that was our asset. We owned it, we controlled it, it gave us an economic benefit as Walmart. They've walked out the door with a bag full of our assets. We've got to credit that asset because we've got to say, hey, that doesn't exist anymore for us. So we're going to credit inventory, socks for two bucks, and we debit a new account called cost of goods sold. And this is just an account that is the cost of the stuff that we sold. And this is an expense account. It's not, we, we don't write the word expense, but it is an expense account and it gets top billing on an income statement. So if you look at your favorite company's income statement, the cost of goods sold expense gets listed right at the top, right below sales revenue. We have sales minus cost of goods sold and um, that computes a, 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 a subtotal called gross profit. Um, in fact, let's compute the gross profit on this transaction. So we're Walmart. We sold our socks. How much money did we make on the deal? Of course, you can look at this and say, well, I sold the socks for five bucks, cost me two, I made three bucks. Well, looking at revenues and expenses, and that's how an accountant looks at things, 
uh, we have sales revenue on the sale of five bucks. We have cost of goods sold, which we'll abbreviate as COGS. The cost of goods sold was two bucks. Five minus two sales minus COGS is three dollars, and we call that subtotal our gross profit. It's not our net profit or our net income because, of course, there's other expenses to running a Walmart. It's not just your profit on that markup. We've got to pay employees, we've got to keep the lights on, we've got to pay property taxes, all sorts of other costs. But the amount of money we made on this transaction just looked at in a vacuum was three bucks. So, uh, looked at at its most basic level. Uh, companies that stock inventory, they buy inventory, debit inventory, credit AP, and when they sell that inventory, there's two journal entries happening. One, debit cash credit sales, and two, debit cost of goods sold credit inventory to get that inventory out the door. You might think we're done. We are not done. You probably saw the timeline on this video going like eight more minutes. Hmm, I'm going to guess eight more minutes. That's my speculation. We'll see. Um, so uh, this gets more complicated. And I want to explain why it gets more complicated with yet another example. So once again, we're Walmart and we are in the market for socks and it's January 1st and we buy our socks for two bucks. I'm not going to put socks in brackets here. I'm just going to say debit inventory, two bucks, credit, AP, two bucks. Okay, so we've bought our socks. Um, we put the socks on the shelf and on January 2nd, we say, you know what? I want to buy some more socks. And so we buy more socks. And we call Haynes and we say, Haynes, we want more socks. And Haynes says, you know what? The price of socks just went up for you guys. You know, gas, oil prices are up. Our costs are up. 210, that's what you got to pay us. And we say, okay, we'll buy them. I'm a buyer. Of course, Walmart would never do that. They drive hard bargains. That's why they're still the largest retailer in the world. Amazon's going to be hot on their heels soon, but Walmart, as of the recording of this video, is the largest retailer in the world. Uh, January 3rd, uh, we decide we want more socks, and Fruit of Loom says, you know what? The price went up again. It's two fifty now. So we, Walmart, decide to pay, and again, Walmart would probably never pay. They'd negotiate. Okay, so January 4th, a customer comes in and they buy the socks. The price is still $5 on the price tag. They didn't, Walmart didn't jack up their price. They just left it the same. And uh, the customer buys the socks. So we go debit, cash, five bucks, credit, sales rev, five bucks, debit, cogs, and credit inventory to record the fact that some inventory is going to walk out the door with our customer. The question for you is, how much should I debit COGS credit inventory? And uh, the answer is, well, it depends. It depends on which inventory method Walmart is using. There's three methods, I no, four methods I want to touch on here, and four methods that you'll typically hear discussed in a class. The first method is called FIFO, and FIFO stands for first in, first, out. And so what FIFO would say in this scenario is the oldest inventory. That's the inventory that's sold. And FIFO actually makes a lot of intuitive sense to me. If you've ever been in a supermarket, they definitely use the FIFO method, right? If you look at the milk, they push the oldest milk to the front and they keep the newest milk in the back. And why is that? Because they're trying to rotate their inventory. So most companies would do something like FIFO and so it makes sense for an accounting system to follow reality. And if we use FIFO, then our COGS would be two bucks, right? The oldest inventory. That would be our cost of goods sold. Uh, and that's, I think, pretty reasonable. Pretty reasonable. Okay, uh, so FIFO, first in, first out. That's the first method we are going to learn. Oldest inventory sells first. Of course, if you're like me and you go in the supermarket, you're climbing through the freezer to get the back of milk so you get the freshest milk. It, it, that's what I do. Uh, I hope you do the same. I do that with all this stuff at the supermarket. I'm sure the supermarket uh, workers don't like me. Okay, next. LIFO. Last in, first out. 
And so what LiFO says is just the opposite. It says the most recent stuff we bought, that's the stuff we sold. I don't like LiFO as much, and accounting standard setters agree with me. So our American cousins are probably the only uh, accounting group, the uh, only economy in the world that allows LIFO inventory accounting. Certainly international accounting standards do not allow LIFO. Canadian accounting standards do not allow LIFO. However, our American cousins do, and so that's why we kind of have to learn it, because uh, uh, the Americans are a very important uh, economy, and it's important to understand the financial statements of American companies. So LIFO says the most recent inventory, that's the stuff uh, that was sold, and that's 250 and of course, if you look at my um, uh, grocery store example, it doesn't really match what's happening in reality, but the accounting system doesn't have to in this case, right? Even though we're selling our newest milk, our oldest milk, we're not selling the newest milk. Uh, LIFO says, no, it's the newest milk that we sold, and we just make that assumption. I think it's a bad assumption, which is why I don't like LIFO, and uh, seems like most standard setters agree with me on that one. Okay, third method is called weighted average or average cost and she's moving weighted average all sorts of words the common word you'll read in your textbook or wherever you're studying will be the word average so you just take an average of what you've got in your inventory so in this case i've got two to ten to fifty so two plus two ten plus two fifty and i'm going to divide that by three so what is that six 60 divided by 3, my average is 220. So that would be my cost of goods sold, 220 in that scenario. The final uh, method I'll show you is called specific unit identification. And specific unit identification says, well, first in, first out, you're just guessing that you sold the first one, or last in, first out, you're guessing that you sold the last one. Why don't we look and see which actual one we sold? Did we sell the actual one that we purchased on January 3rd? If so, then cost of goods sold is 250. Did we sell the actual one from January 2nd? If so, then the uh, cost of goods sold is 210. So it depends, I guess would be my answer for that one. What, which one sold, question mark. So yeah, which one did we sell? That will be our cost of goods sold. Um, probably doesn't make sense to do this for socks, uh, but if you're a Toyota dealership, right, and you have three black Toyota Camrys sitting on the lot, and some customer buys a Toyota Camry, you're probably not going to say, oh, what's the average cost of the Camrys, or which, um, what was the first in? We'll just assume that that was the one we sold. No, you probably track each one, right? You know, okay, this one we bought on this date, this one we bought on this date, you know, these are the vehicle ID numbers, the serial numbers. You know which one was bought and which one was sold. So if your company trades in either really big ticket items or one-of-a-kind items or things like that, you wouldn't use FIFO or weighted average. This is for when your company sells, like, batches of all the same thing you would be uh, uh, more likely, if you sold one-of-a-kind items, to track them individually. So that's what specific unit identification has you do. I don't have problems on specific unit ID because it's, it's hard to make a problem. You say, oh, well, we sold the $2.10 one, and then the student writes, oh, the cost of the gold must be two ten. It's not really a problem, right? Uh, so harder to write problems with specific unit ID, but we have good problems for FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average awaiting you in our next few videos. Stay tuned.